Welcome to Amateur Bomb Museum, the poetry podcast 10 out of 10 itinerant bards prefer. I'm your host, Victoria Brockmeyer, and I could not be happier to have you here for episode 2. We're picking up from last week with another poem about poetry, Richard Wilbur's poem, Junk. It begins with an epigraph, which is a term for these little bits of poetry or prose authors sometimes place at the beginning of a work, which is in Old English. When someone tells me they had trouble reading something from, say, the 1500s, or for that matter from the 1800s because of the Old English, I get out this poem and its epigraph to show them what Old English actually is. I will pull it right up on my phone. The people who complain about Old English, this is never what they're complaining about. Wilbur attached a note to Junk to tell us that these lines come from a fragmentary Anglo-Saxon poem that critics have given the title Walder, the name of its main character. He quotes this bit to set up his poem. Choro Willandis, Vork Nikaswichid, Mona Anigam, Dara de Miming Kan Hirna Gehaldim. That is Old English. My pronunciation isn't great, but that's basically what we're dealing with. If you tell me you have trouble reading that, okay. If you say the same thing about Alexander Pope, I have no sympathy for you. Wilbur translates the passage as Truly, Wayland's handiwork, the sword miming which he made, will never fail any man who knows how to use it bravely. Wayland is a mythical smith figure like Hephaestus or Vulcan in classical mythology. He also shows up under the name Wallander in Beowulf and some Old Norse texts. Miming is the name of one of these magical objects that the hero, here Waldera, gets that he then uses to go do heroic deeds with. So this is just a little snippet about how amazing miming is. That's going to become important to the rest of the poem, the basic idea that people make things and we use them and the poem extends, they eventually break and become junk. This epigraph also sets up a form that Wilbur uses throughout his poem. It's called Strong Stress Alliterative Meter. Today, and for the past several hundred years, English writers have used end rhyme as the main obvious feature to structure their poems those repeated sounds at the ends of line, moon, june, croon, tune, and on and on. But at one point, poets using this language that would become English did something very different. We repeated sounds through the middles of individual lines, and that repeated sound, that technique is called alliteration, and we repeated those sounds specifically at the beginnings of stressed syllables. Strong stress alliterative meter. So, in this first line, there's a W sound that's repeated, and in the second, it's an M sound. Choro Willandis, Wark Nigeswichid, Mana Anigam, Dara de Miming Ken, Hirdne Gehalden. We don't get enough of that third line to know what its repeated sound might be, possibly H. Incidentally, breaking up lines like this visually is a common printing convention with poetry. It's called a dropped line. You may have seen it in Shakespeare's plays, used when the last words of one character's speech and the first words of another taken together form one metrical line of poetry. And if you'd seen that and not known why they did it, now you know. If you haven't dealt with poetry at all before, and I hope there are some people listening who haven't, when we say line, we mean a literal, physical, single line of text on the page, not just any group of words that go together as in an actor's lines or pickup lines, etc. In that sense of line, then, each upper and lower piece together are considered one line. Each of junk drops highlights what's called a sejura, a natural pause in the middle of a line. Sejuri occur at the ends of phrases or sentences, between items in a list, any of those places where you naturally pause in speech. Pauses at the ends of lines of poetry have other names and other effects, which we'll talk about with other poems. Here we're looking at pauses within single lines, sejuri. In this form, the alliteration is divided by these sejuri, so you get two of the same stressed sounds on one side of the pause, and a third plus a different stress sound on the other side, for a total of four, stress, uh, four stresses per line. So these specifically are medial sejuri, pauses that divide the lines into metrically equal parts, same number of strong stresses on each side of the pause. For our medieval Anglo-Saxon poets, then, instead of showing your skill by creating systems of rhymes at the ends of your lines, the trick of the day was to create these networks of sound within your lines. 
Wilbur uses this very old form throughout junk, writing, of course, in modern English. Listen for the stressed alliterations. <clears throat> An axe angles from my neighbor's ash can. It is hell's handiwork, the wood not hickory, the flow of the grain not faithfully followed. The shivered shaft rises from a shell heap of plastic playthings, paper plates, and the sheer shards of shattered tumblers that were not annealed for the time needful. At the same curbside, a cast-off cabinet of wavily warped, unseasoned wood waits to be trundled in the trash man's truck. Hull them off! Hide them! The heart winces for junk and gimcrack, for jerry-built things and the men who make them for a little money, bartering pride like the bought boxer who pulls his punches, or the paid-off jockey who in the home stretch holds in his horse. Yet the things themselves, in thoughtless honor, have kept composure, like captives who would not talk under torture. Tossed from a tailgate where the dump displays its random dolmens, its black barrows and blazing valleys, they shall waste in the weather toward what they were. The sun shall glory in the glitter of glass chips, foreseeing the salvage of the prison sand, and the blistering paint peel off in patches that the good grain be discovered again. Then, burnt, bulldozed, they shall all be buried to the depths of diamonds in the making dark, where Halt Hephaestus keeps his hammer and Wayland's work is worn away. This poem breaks into three sections of just about equal length, not divided visually with stanza breaks on the page, but just looking at the content. The first ten lines, counting those dropped lines as one each, not two, describe a bunch of junk. Then for eight and a half lines, the poem assesses all that stuff, reacts to it, and to the people Wilbur imagines having made it. And then the last eleven and a half lines describe what happens to our junk after we throw it away, eventually tying up with the epigraph at the top. This first topical section of junk lists off a bunch of broken things, thrown away and waiting to be picked up as trash. This is a pretty good example of how poetry is often a craft of observation before it's even a craft of writing. We have three objects here, with a couple details for each one. First, there's an axe with a broken handle, which was made out of some wood other than hickory. Hickory being a very strong wood, so it makes a good quality tool handle. And this is inferior crap wood that broke. Next, we have a shell heap. And that word shell heap at the end of line four that's a term archaeologists use for the deposits they find of things like broken pottery, bones, ashes, seashells. Basically, it's the waste from cooking that people leave behind. Wilbur uses the word for our trash, uh, and as he describes it here, it includes plastic toys, throwaway paper plates, and broken drinking glasses. He's using word choice to identify this modern trash with the stuff archaeologists use to build a picture of our ancestors' material culture. It elevates it. Makes it it uh, makes our trash a little bit meaningful in the very literal sense of containing information about how we live that someone in the future could read back out of it. Finally, we have a cabinet made out of unseasoned wood. Seasoned wood has been dried thoroughly, which allows it to shrink and change its shape if it's going to do so before you make anything out of it. That takes time. The word seasoned comes from the idea that wood should sit for a full season before you use it, and space, though, so cheaper stuff sometimes get made out of greenwood, which may then warp out of the shape you wanted it to be. The poem tells us that's what happened to this cabinet. Medicine cabinet, maybe a little end table with cabinet storage, something like that. We have a few loaded terms, like that shell heap, and the wood warped, and the phrase hell's handiwork. But so far, this is pretty much just a recording of observations. It's just description, reportage. Wilbur uses a technique, technique here, I'm not even sure if there's a name for it, but the poem's attention moves over a single scene, just like a video camera. I point this out because while it's possible that this records an actual assemblage of objects Richard Wilbur, poet, saw in his neighbor's trash one morning, there's no reason to assume that. Poets do this all the time. Think of a few things from different experiences that would go well in a poem, and we set them in a single scene. It might be things we saw or experienced at different times, or things we completely made up, or some of each. 
And we won't just mention or list them together, we do this. We put them in a single concrete scene and we give them relationships to each other. The axe is sticking out of the heap of broken toys and dishes, all of which is sitting in a particular trash can, and then the cabinet sits next to the trash can at the same curb. Again, it could have been this way in real life. But if so, at the least, Wilbur chose to maintain that grouping rather than just listing and describing the items individually, uh, not tying them together as a lesser poet might do. It reinforces what we call verisimilitude, the sense that these objects were lifted directly from reality, rather than just made up, even though they may well have been. This poet, the least he's doing is to have picked what he saw in his neighbor's crash can on this particular day out of any day when less interesting things might have been there. There's always a degree of artifice, as soon as you even choose to write about one thing rather than another. On that note, take a second to consider just how realistic Junk's trash heap is. Most of the trash in my household is food packaging, and I don't even eat a lot of pre-prepared stuff. It's still a lot of boxes and wrappers and bags. Decent amount of mail, too, although much less than what we had when I was growing up before email. A lot of what America throws out in general is food waste. And none of that's represented here. Other than the paper plates, everything else here was intended to be used for some time. These aren't things you anticipate throwing away as soon as you get home. It's not just packaging. They didn't start out as junk, but they became junk when they wore out. This poem was published in 1961, so a different era in many ways, but our trash 50 to 60 years ago wasn't more full of once broken, once useful broken objects than it was of cereal boxes and pop cans and bills and so on. Future archaeologists would be misled if they looked to Wilbur's shell heap for accurate information about mid-century American life. This is the similar hiding inside the verisimilitude of art. It's something that appears true. Whether it is true or not, and if so, in what ways, are separate questions. Incidentally, this is one of the reasons Plato bans poets from his Republic, because we play around with reality. You'd have to be pretty hardcore to be upset that Richard Wilbur might have altered or invented the trash in a poem he wrote. But think about something that deals with highly charged political events or personal struggles. Our responses to that kind of writing uh, often depends on a sense that they happened, that the writer is trusting us with some truth. I have a poem in my book, My Maiden Cowboy Names, about anorexia. And a couple of the times when I've read it, someone has come up to me afterwards and said, thank you so much for reading that poem. That meant more to me than I can say. And I just reply with noncommittal stuff about what a compliment it is to have one's work connect with listeners and how I believe that one of poetry's most important roles is to give us avenues into difficult subjects, things like that, because I've never been anorexic or had any kind of eating disorder. Apparently, I managed to write about it reasonably accurately, but it's not because I've been there. It's because I'm a writer. Well, Wilbur has written this little curbside still life, and next, he's going to start editorializing about the objects and about the men, 1961, remember, who make them. The dominant emotion is shame. Haul them off, hide them. Garbage collection isn't just carrying away stuff we don't want, it's hiding our shameful secrets. And remember, it's just broken stuff. Very ordinary broken stuff. Tools, kids' toys, small, inexpensive pieces of furniture, we're not dumping the victims of a brutal government massacre in a mass grave here. We're just sending perfectly normal, broken junk to the dump. It's not just those things that are embarrassing either, but the craft's people, today being 2017, who made them. Wilbur compares them to a boxer throwing a match and a jockey intentionally losing a race for a little money. So, cheaters! Following out the logic, someone who makes really high quality axes or cabinets would be like an athlete who wins by skill and dedication. The way Wilbur assigns guilt here is distinctly 20th century. I would be very surprised, in fact flat out weirded out, to see someone publish a poem today criticizing people who make inexpensive stuff and implying that if they had integrity they'd be making better quality things. Where's the market, right? Lots more people can buy cheap tools made with pine handles, or plastic handles, than lovingly handcrafted artisanal hammers or whatever. A 2017 poem about junk would probably admonish the people who buy cheap junk and just toss it when it breaks. 
or it might focus on the abusive labor conditions, the low wages, mistreatment of employees, and all that good stuff involved in its production. Not so much valorizing quality uncritically. But this poem is from 1961, and we haven't yet exploited impoverished workers across the globe to the degree we have today, let alone reached an awareness of how connected I am, ordering a spice rack on eBay for eight bucks, to the women who in, in Indonesia who created it. And so, Wilbur's saying that there's a moral dimension to craft, and that the people who throw things together out of substandard materials are doing something unethical. He changes his tune when talking about the things themselves, though. Where the people who made them are cheating, sell-out athletes, their products have a kind of nobility. They're like captives who would not talk under torture. 1961. The U.S. has been formally invo involved in the Vietnam War for about six years, so that comparison would have had strong resonances at the time. We didn't yet have American POWs in Vietnam, but we'd had them in World War II and in Korea, and those memories were fresh. And certainly, there were people being held and tortured, just not yet American soldiers. The idea would have hit quite close to home. And that's how Wilbur chooses to characterize this junk. It's a really strange comparison. The torture here is maybe being poorly made in the first place, or just undergoing normal use that breaks you. And let's be real, it's a little easier to keep your composure, keep from spilling secrets, if you're a beat-up wooden cabinet than it is if you're a kid halfway around the world being brutalized by enemy soldiers. I like it. It shifts the poem's tone very quickly from shame to reverence, and it invokes sympathy just very powerfully, but I do want to point out how bizarre the comparison is if you unpack it. The poem glides right over that. And that's another thing poets do. We assert kind of insane things and just go on as though nothing could be more reasonable. We're persuasive because we rarely let on that we're even trying to persuade you. We act like we're still just reporting on reality long after we've moved into, as I said earlier, editorializing. The tonal shift right there is a great, just really acrobatic display of that mastery of reader's experience. Once we've found this sympathy with our discarded junk, the poem follows it to the landfill and projects way down into the future, into, in fact, an archaeological and ultimately mythical timescale, fulfilling the hint in Wilbur's use of that discipline-specific word shell heap early on. He picks that thread back up by referring to the structures in a dump as dolmens, dolmens being a type of stone tomb, usually big stones stood on end with another laid across them, kind of table-shaped, and barrows, another kind of ancient tomb, uh, those are the ones where we raised up a big hill of earth over a burial site. Really what we're looking at are refrigerators, maybe couches turned up on end, that sort of thing for dolmens, and piles of garbage for barrows. Again, Wilbur's asserting an identity between our trash and our ancestors' burial grounds. It's a hallowing of trash, a sacralizing of it. The next sentence gives us the poem's big reveal. Our damaged, discarded things will waste in the weather toward what they were. Look at that verb for a second, waste. Ordinarily, waste means to squander, to use something up without accomplishing anything, to use too much of something, or alternatively in the phrase waste away, to diminish over time, wither. Usually because of sickness, the connection there that wasting away is a waste of life. That's not at all what's happening here. It would make a pretty ugly line, but we could sub in transform as a synonym. The following lines make clear the poem envisions all our trash eventually transforming into useful, valuable, raw material again. What's really cool about this moment is that in this sentence, the controlling verb waste is itself transformed. It's given a new meaning that it's never had before anywhere else. And waste as a noun is a synonym for trash. So the poem turns trash into something new and powerful, enacts that transformation right in its own word choices. At the landfill here, the junk goes through two stages. First, it's revealed as beautiful. We're told that the sun will glory in the glitter of glass chips for seeing the salvage of the prison sand. If you've ever heard the phrase pathetic fallacy, this is what it's talking about. It's attributing human experiences or expressions to nature. A more neutral term for the same technique is personification. 
The Victorians really did not like people writing about weather as though it had moods, for example, and so John Ruskin, major Victorian critic, coined this phrase, pathetic fallacy, to describe that. I see it crop up off and on. People use it in contexts where they clearly don't know what it means. This is it here. The claim that the sun is excited about the shards of glass that they're going to be worn back down into sand. That's the pathetic fallacy. The poem wants us to be excited about that, and it shows us that excitement by putting it into the sun. Not so different from maybe putting together the objects at the curb where we started. These are the kinds of conscious choices poets make. Lies! The sun does not get excited. I threw that cabinet out two years before my axe broke. Moving along. In this first transformative phase, the good grain in the wood gets discovered again as the paint peels off, underscoring that the problem was never in the material itself, but in how that material was treated, shaped badly, used before it was ready. With that inner goodness affirmed, our junk, the poem foresees, will be churned underground to the depth of diamonds. Most of our original objects, the axe's handle, the wood cabinet, the plastic, and the paper, are carbon-based, so they could conceivably transform into diamond. Always nice to see scientific accuracy in poems. Note, though, that junk suggests diamonds as a possible future for our trash. It doesn't actually decide what happens. As specific as it's been all the way through so far, this remains partially in suspension. It leaves our junk in a state of possibility. It could become anything. And that is how creativity works. Not that you get diamonds, necessarily. Just that you get something you didn't have before. The last two lines take us from that geological time scale into myth, and, as I promised, tie the poem to its epigraph. The depth where diamonds are made is also Hephaestus's supply closet, apparently, where he keeps his hammer, and interestingly, where Wayland's work is worn away. These are our divine smiths who make weapons and armors for heroes and gods, and we've ended up in a place where transformation is so powerful that it even wears their creations down into dust, sand, unrecognizable blobs of metal, whatever they might become. The mythic turn is, I think, crucial not just to making the poem work, but in terms of saving it for our era as well. You would really have to pull some tricks out of your hat to put plastic in the trash in a poem today and not have it be about environmental devastation. Styrofoam cups that people suck a sonic milkshake out of and throw away 20 minutes later are going to outlast the pyramids. On a human time scale, that's a crisis. Even on a geological time scale, it's a problem. We kind of have to get out of reality, period, and enter the world of myth for throwing plastic away to be okay. Whether or not that's really a valid way to deal with the ecological ethics of poetry from the past century, I don't know. I do want to at least just address the moments of dissonance in reading what is still a pretty interesting poem qua poem from where we are now. I also said at the beginning that junk is secretly a poem about poetry, and having worked through it, we're now in a position to step back and put those pieces together. Wilbur wrote this poem in this very old form, strong stress alliterative meter, that originated in a different language, a language that predates ours, that's long dead, one that has transformed profoundly and become modern English. He has recovered that ancient form and made a pretty excellent poem with it in this newer, different tongue. Unstated, one of the old broken things we throw out is poetry. Techniques or language or images or topics that lie forgotten for ages can, and this poem both suggests and demonstrates, should be recovered. Look back at two of the unusual word choices to which I drew our attention, shell heap and waste. They both occupy those stressed alliterative syllables. The axe's shivered shaft rises from a shell heap, that's sh sounds, and the things the trash truck conveys to the dump shall waste in the weather toward what they were. W sounds. The wh sound in what, that wh, is actually a different phoneme than plain old w, single w, by the way. So Wilbur still has his three total alliterations on the w's, with two on one side of the sejura and one on the other. I couldn't speculate on the process as far as which came first, wanting to use those words or needing to match the alliteration in those lines, but however it happened, 
The poem has words that perform its ideas especially strongly in places where the form really matters. Something that writers and artists have been saying at least since the 1930s, if not longer, constraint doesn't hamper creativity, it drives it. Structure in art, which in poetry includes sound patterns, gives you something to respond to. It pushes your work in directions it wouldn't have taken otherwise. Taking up an old form that belongs to another language and making it work isn't just a show-offy thing to do, although it is kind of show-offy, or, less pejoratively, kind of impressive. But it's also a way to shake up your habits, to shift around your default settings and blind spots so you can make something really new. And if you're lucky, one of those diamonds from the making dark, something really good. See what your junk you have lying around in your house or on your head and what new stuff you might make with it. And do send me your questions, comments, poem requests, and plans for verbal domination as an ask at the Tumblr, amateurbombmuseum.tumblr.com, or email them to me at amateur.bomb.museum at gmail.com. I'll see you next time with selections from HD's book, Helen in Egypt.